The following interview was conducted with Morris Rappert for the Purdue University Oral History Program on uh, Tuesday, October the 14th, 2008. This is part two of the interview. We'll pick up from where we can, uh, left off. Let's talk a little bit more about serotonin and the nuts and bolts and take it away. The, uh, let's talk a little bit about the serotonin club. All right. It, it had its initial meeting in, uh, in Heron Island in, um, in Australia in 1987. In 1988, there was a meeting, a second meeting of the Serotonin Club in, uh, in Las Vegas. And I was invited to that uh, by, um, see, uh, afternoon, I'm beginning to okay. forget names, right. by, the, by the man from, from Lily who first uh, discovered that Prozac was useful in in, uh, in depression, and that was a billion dollar drug. And and he invited me to this, this serotonin club, the second meeting of the serotonin club, and the club Paul van Houta was one of the originators of the club, and during that meeting I gave a talk on the whole process of discovery and the people who were involved in it. And Paul uh, made me an honorary member of the club. It's kind of interesting that in a meeting in Sapporo, where they had the first Rapport lecture, uh, the president made me honorary member of the club because he had forgotten I already was an honorary member of the club. So you got two honorary. So, so, two, <laughs> so I should get a square that's, on. <laughs> that's a claim honorary fame. member square at a serotonin club. Sure. But the, the, the fact is that, that uh, the most interesting part of the story, after the identification of the substance, which made it available synthetically, and not just made it available, but be, led to a competition amongst drug companies to distribute it, because they did not see anything useful in it. Even 10 years later, in a report to the owners of the Upjohn Company, by the man who first synthesized it. Uh, he, he wrote up the, the story and said that there was, no, there was no financial usefulness associated with it. So then uh, the question is, what, what makes a, a discovery important? And that's the unique aspect of, of serotonin discovery that once the material was available so that everybody in the world could study it. They studied it and they were, and the objective was to find out, well, what does it do? What is its function in the body? And the answer couldn't come from pharmacology because these things don't necessarily operate directly. They operate through second mechanisms so that the primary me mechanism is attachment of the serotonin to a receptor, and then the receptor starts something else going. And that something else is what causes the effects that are seen. And in the case of serotonin, there were so many receptors. And with different mechanisms as a result of their actions on the receptors, that the picture could never be easily defined. And that is the interesting aspect of it now, with a club of at least 600 members, international club, which tends to meet, which does meet every two years, and usually in association with the International Union of Pharmacology. All of the people who are studying various aspects of serotonin come together and talk about them, and it is still developing. Not all of the receptors' functions are known, and those functions that have been established, it's the interplay with not just other serotonin receptors, but with neurotransmitters of a different structure, such as dopamine and serotonin interact at the same receptor. And so that this, this leads to a, a more profound appreciation of the complexity of the functioning of the brain, so that 
we look forward in years ahead to many new discoveries. And it turns out, of course, that serotonin is not limited to the brain. It's, it's one of the discoverers of the, of, the, of the substance activity, pharmacological activity, was an Italian earth bomber who first discovered it from its histological uh, reaction in, in, in the GI tract and also in, in lower animals, in the posterior glands of the octopus. And, and it's even present in plants, I think, in the skin of the banana. So nobody understands yet what the multiple roles of these neurotransmitters are. What we do know is that serotonin was one of the earliest of the neurotransmitters because its appearance is in one of the older parts of the brain, in the brain stem. And from there, it reaches out to all other parts of the brain. So it is associated with many other activities that are still not possible to clearly define. So that's the promise of the complexity of understanding an organ as complicated as the brain is. Mm -hmm. So it all starts with, with a seed, the seed being chemically defined structure, which makes the material available. Mm -hmm. And, and I expect that, uh, that for many years to come, this club is still getting larger and involves many different countries. And with the, at the present time, of course, the major emphasis is on usefulness for drugs that interfere with the action of serotonin to alter behaviors that are considered abnormal. And of course, the original, the original association was because LSD was well, well known, and the structural analogy between serotonin and LSD immediately made a connection. And that, that a connection, an attempt was made to exploit that in terms of all of the derangements in the brain that lead to mental disorders. They haven't panned out because the mental disorders are more complex than a simple association of disturbance of a single system. Mm -hmm. Even schizophrenia, it, it, to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia, you have 12 symptoms, and if you have six of them, then they give you a diagnosis. But all of these disorders are different, or could be different, because of, as we now understand, none of the processes are simple processes. They're all chains of events. and the initiation of the events is through receptors, but then the, the events then start out a, a further chain of reaction. All of these are being worked on at the present time. It's an ongoing. Yes, ongoing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the original work, uh, the, the main characters that really were involved in the, in the um, isolation uh, were myself and Arthur Green, who was doing the assays, and Irvin Page, who was really responsible for the, for the support of this project. As a matter of fact, uh, I think some of the support came from the U.S. Public Health Service. We had somebody came around to look at the research that was going on, and he thought that our project was the most promising, although it had not gotten very far yet. And. Uh, after that, of course, everybody who was interested in pharmacology uh, may have been involved. I don't know, but uh, for example, some of the material that was left, Paige let me keep some of the material, which I was then able to uh, define the, uh, the chemistry of. But I had left material with him to do pharmacology. He didn't do that. I learned through the grapevine that he turned it over to the chemist who replaced me and that person couldn't get anywhere with it. And then eventually, I think that, that uh, the Abbott Company approached him. Uh, they were interested in it because, and they started to work on it. But that was after the Upjohn people had approached me and had already started to work on it even before they approached me. They asked me how they could help, and I subsequently learned that they were already working on the synthesis. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know, by this time, there were 10, 10 to 12 different syntheses, syntheses of, of 5-hydroxytryptamine, that the indole structure lends itself to many different ways of approaching, approaching it. And the, and the different companies did it in different ways. But there were more improvements to get more success in getting higher yields. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, Erstbarmer in Italy was able to persuade Pharmitalia to make it. And they tried to promote it as a drug for, uh, for assistance in blood clotting. I think they called it Antimovis and set it up in ampoules, which they distributed. But it never really took off in this respect because it was not, its effect in blood clotting has not been pinned down yet. It may have something to do with the way the platelets aggregate to stop, up, to stop the flow of blood. And even more recently, there are um, stories on the way that serotonin may do this. Now, a very interesting paper that was called to my attention recently where the way that serotonin works in the brain is still far from understanding. That, that the models that are used are, are mice and rats. In the case of mice, you can now use molecular pharmacological techniques to block the, 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 bio, the biochemical synthesis of the material. For example, the first step in the biosynthesis from tryptophan is to put, that's an amino acid, is to put a hydroxy group uh, onto the ring. And it's called tryptophan hydroxylase. Now you can block that enzyme so that no serotonin is made. And in these mice, there is no serotonin detected in the brain, and there is nothing to see in the behavior of the mice to account for the absence of it. Hmm. And, and that means that the behavior that you study in the mouse is not going to help you an awful lot in understanding the behavior in higher animals. It's an interesting development, mm -hmm. very recent. Mm -hmm. So people will be working with that. And actually, there are, there are two, there's a, there's a tryptophan hydroxylase one, which is present in the brain. This is a tryptophan hydroxylase two, which is used to make serotonin in other parts of the body, okay. mainly in the gastrointestinal tract. Okay. So this is, a, 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 I mentioned that because it says that in many cases, the models that are available to study the function of these substances are still not adequate to deal with what we're trying to learn. On the kind of, uh, question further on the serotonin club, what, what disciplines are, are they all in chemistry or in primarily sciences in the pharmacy? They're primarily pharmacologists okay. working in drug companies okay. or, or associated with support from drug companies, but essentially working on... That's a large group, 600. Yes, it's a large group, and, and that's 600 members, right. not, a, not, not all of the people who are working on it. It's, sure. It's a membership a little more than 600. Uh, but, but when they come together at these meetings, they touch on many different areas. And one of the most important ones is the one that... Uh, that Dave is interested in, which is psychedelics. And, and of course, the initial structural determination of Syria immediately made a connection to psychedelics. And, and the psychedelics at that time were thought to be a clue to the functioning of the whole brain. There are limitations on that. I believe that the psychedelics create um, uh, visual, visual disturbances, uh, visual hallucinations. Whereas the schizophrenia, I think, is more an auditory hallucinations. So that the difference between visual and, and auditory represents different parts of the brain and how these things are turned on. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that uh, Dave has a more profound understanding of how complicated psychedelic function is. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so you really have a, com it's a commitment 
you want it for researchers. It's a commitment to keep on with this. Your commitment is, has always been there pretty strong for the research in serotonin. Well, I was not able to continue it. I, I tried and, and was actually involved in, in uh, testing the effect of serotonin infusions. But you know, there's a, a tumor called a, 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 a um, and I'm blocking on that, uh, in which produces large amounts of serotonin. And the effect on the people that get this large amount in, of this tumor, in, in, you're from the tumor, mm -hmm. is not very extensive. There were just a few symptoms. There's a flush. There's a uh, there's a, some amount of of depression, some effect on the GI tract, but nothing that that is any kind of clue to administering serotonin itself, because normally serotonin, of course, doesn't penetrate to the brain. As, 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 as an amine. It's tryptophan gets into the brain, but, not, but the amines do not. They're blocked by the blood-brain barrier. But in, in case of, these, of, this, of this particular uh, uh, tumor, uh, there aren't too many cases of it, but it was, it was a, 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 at least an opportunity to study uh, humans that had large amounts of this material in their blood. Uh, so all of these represented individual studies that were thought to be useful clues to the function of serotonin. But at the present time, what we have more is a sophistication with respect to how to look for functions. Okay. Okay. Uh -oh. One one thing that I read, the, you said the ro or about the role of serotonin in everything. Is that well? That's an exaggeration. But let's say clarify, you've, clarify you clarify that. Yeah. You have well. I, I think the whole functioning of the body is regulated by the brain. This is a really master organ, and uh, and if you have fourteen kinds of receptors when a receptor on a particular cell can regulate the way that particular cell functions, then the complexity of having interactions of different cells to produce some behavioral effect are enormous number of possibilities. And so against the background of that complexity, the need is for finding ways of getting more specific interactions between substances that will interfere with, with the processes. Because basically, you study function by interfering with some process and seeing what the effect is. And so the objective is now in the realm of chemistry to develop more complicated molecules and administer them and, and see what behavioral changes can be observed. But the question of behavioral observed and changes in what? You can't use the mouse anymore for this purpose. So the question is, what, what models are really available for studying function? Any comment, further comment on that, about models? Any further comment on that, I think? Well, the models, unfortunately, are human. And, and I think that the, the real problem, the real problem is that, uh, that everybody's different. Of the human population, it's very hard to make generalizations about anything because uh, we all look different. <laughs> we all have these changes that have occurred over time. And so getting a, a, a generalization with respect to the effect of some drug on some process is, is somewhere on a curve, and the question, what's the shape of the curve? Right, is it something with a sharp shape, in which case there are very few people being involved in it? Or is it a very broad curve, which you have more people that are, uh, can be con uh, uh, connected to this particular observation? And I think that it's one of the biggest problems we have of, of testing drugs in an in a aging population, 
to try to get things that, that really work specifically enough not to cause side effects that are harmful. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk, just make a couple comments on um, what, what is uh, the effect on the on neuroscience, on the fields of neuroscience and neuropsychopharmacology. Any comment on that, the serotonin effect, research? Well, neuroscience is, is, is a, the largest field of investigation other than cancer at the present time because neuroscience governs everything that's going on in the body. And, and this, this organ, when you think of, of the different parts of the body, of the muscles and the different, that regulate different parts of the body, they're all put together in the brain in these different segments of the brain. And so that neuroscience is a huge field that covers everything. So the Society for Neuroscience involves all of the subdivisions, pharmacology, physiology, uh, chemistry, biochemistry, go you on and on, you mention any field, it has relevance to okay, neuroscience right. okay. to some degree. All right, okay. What about the neuropsychopharmacology? Any comment on that? That's a little separate field. I'm thinking for the research. Well, neuropsychopharmacology has its main thrust in finding drugs to alter behaviors that can be controlled, such as depression or, or obsessive compulsive disorder or anxiety or panic disorder, things that, that can be defined by psychiatrists to some degree, schizophrenia, and to find drugs that will affect that particular behavior without having harmful side effects. Okay. So that's the main focus from the standpoint of neuropharmacology. Drugs that are useful in dealing with mental disorders because mental disorders have been the hardest to deal with over time. Nobody knew how to deal with people who don't behave properly. And it's still a big problem in our society of how, what do you do with people uh, whose function has been interfered with so that they no longer serve a useful purpose. That's the, the, the line uh, that, that, that separates people who can still function, even with mental disorders. A lot of us have depression, but can still function. Even people with schizophrenia, some of them can still function to some degree. And those whose, who, whose disorder is so prominent that it interferes with their ability to function. Right. Okay. Good point. All right. Um, that's what I've got. Let's talk a little bit about how about some awards and honors. You going to share some of those that you've received over time? Yes. Good. They are fairly limited, but are at the time rewarding and uh, they start out with uh, with college which is really uh, Phi Beta Kappa I think is still recognized as a prominent one and and in graduate school Sigma Psi is still considered a prominent one and the others come along more or less as, as a recognition of achievement in, in different fields. Uh, one of the mistakes I made was to move uh, from, to different fields because the recognition you need comes from perseverance in a single field. If you move to other fields, it's resented to some degree. And I moved from what I was doing with serotonin to the connective tissue field and then subsequently to the cancer field and then back to the neuroscience field. Okay. And so these other awards are fellow of, I forget what they're, I've listed them down there and I don't remember them. Uh, but you've got a pin on there from the American Chemical Society. Yeah, well, that's just, that's just live long enough to be a 50 year member of the American Chemical Society. <laughs> They have a luncheon specialty for that with a pretty little pin that goes with it. Do you still attend some of the association uh, meetings of any of the ones that you belong to? Um, well, I retired 22 years ago, 
and and it was circumstances that were not entirely pleasant. And so uh, part of the excitement was I was able to return to the laboratory, which which was pretty exciting for a while, except the project then required more uh, labor-intensive work. You had to, when you purify materials, you have to stay with columns longer periods of time. And there wasn't enough laboratory space. And then my wife became ill, and so I sort of gave it up. Mm -hmm. And about that time, uh, I retired in 1986, and have been associated with the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where I had worked for 10 years since that time. And then the field has taken off with this, with this genome uh, elaboration. And, the, and it's become extremely complicated. The, these are newer techniques for approaching solution to some problems. And these solutions are not really solutions. They are indications of greater complexity. For example, you can study a gene that may regulate something. But that gene is regulated in itself. And those regulations are, are not well understood. Uh, for example, uh, there was a time when the work I was doing was criticized as being uh, epigenetic, which meant it wasn't really intrinsic to the cell's behavior. Now, epigenetic behavior is even more important because it suddenly turns out that methylation of chromosomes, methylation of DNA affects the way genes are regulated. So that the whole field has become much larger. And, and as it does this, it excludes people who aren't intimately working with it. They get some understanding of where it's going, but not to the point where they can be critical of the work that's going on. Because as a matter of fact, from the very beginning in the isolation work, the critical aspect of, of success was to get numbers in somewhere into the process. In, in the case of the assay of serotonin, there were two aspects to assaying its effectiveness. There was the intensity of the effect on the vasoconstriction and the duration. And there were no other substances that had that same double uh, vari variability. So in order to get an assay of the material, you had to get something that would do the same thing as the standard you had set up. And, that, and it, since it wasn't proportional to the amount, you had to make dilutions of what you were studying until it would reproduce what the standard was doing exactly. But until you had those numbers, you really couldn't proceed well. And today, those numbers are no longer available. In the, in the, in the science that's going on today, it's very hard to get these numbers. You get qualitative effects, but if you ask people what's the source of error in the techniques they're using, they don't know. Interesting. But without numbers, there's no way of finding out. Why, why are the numbers not available? Why is that? Because numbers really mean understanding two things. One is how whatever is being studied varies in the degree of change that's been introduced. And second, the timing of it. The factor of timing isn't being dealt with at all. Okay. But the processes in the body are very much dependent on timing. The whole development, some things are, are, occur within very short periods of time and other longer periods of time. But to study time effects is much more elaborate and extensive study to, to develop that kind of information. And in the hurry to get things done, there's no time to do them that well. Okay, I see. That clarifies it very. Tell us a little bit about family, um, you know, your family that you have, your children, and 
Tell us about that. Well, Kevin. as a matter of fact, uh, I, I, I attribute the birth of my daughter to my success in the isolation of serotonin. Okay. And, and uh, we can put that under awards and honors and I then would, some. I would say that's my major award and honor. And, and uh, my daughter will be 60 in December. My son just turned 55. Okay. And they are very fine citizens. What do the, each of them do? What careers do they have? Uh, my daughter is a psychotherapist. And uh, she got me involved with something. You know, she used to go to, when she was going to uh, City College, she was involved in what's called um, sensitivity training. And she could never describe what it was. And when I got this position at the Psychiatric Institute, she insisted that I go for this kind of training that was available in a more conservative form under the auspices of the National Education Alliance, I believe. And so I thought I was too old. I was 50 years old. So she got me connected with somebody who said, no, you're not too old. So I went, I went uh, and un undertook this experience for a two-week period, and it was one of the most exciting times of my life. <laughs> You learn something about behavior that is essential in doing any kind of work. And I looked back on it and found out that one of my difficulties all along in my work was that I missed the whole socialization process that comes as you grow up through childhood and teenage experiences where you learn to deal with people. And I missed all of that because of difficulties in my family and the way my mother uh, excluded me from some kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. So learning about them subsequently, mainly through my work in science, has been one of the more exciting aspects Sounds good. <laughs> of what I've learned. Good. Very good. That's good to hear. And what does your son? What does your son do? Well, my my, my son is, I think, is, is, is superbly trained. He is, he he wanted to get involved with uh, with transportation planning. He got a he got a uh, he got a, a, a scholarship to Berkeley, and learned there that you can't do transportation planning without a civil engineering degree. So he got involved in urban planning and persuaded to, to Berkeley to give him a combined degree in urban planning and something else. And then I think I talked him into it, although he doesn't agree to that, to go to law school, because I thought law school would be useful no matter what field you go into today. And he eventually got a, a job with the city attorney in Oakland and worked there for four years. And during that time, the Oakland a Athletics, that's the baseball team, wanted to leave the city. And he thought that would be a disaster. So he wrote a 13-page letter, and they read it. And on the basis of his letter, they kept the <laughs> Oakland Athletics in, in <laughs> Oakland. I have to remind him about this. He's forgotten. He forgot. I huh? thought it was a singular achievement. <laughs> and, and then he, he, he his, 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 uh, his capability, uh, was recognized by the by the by the uh, the city manager, and so he moved from the city attorney's office to the city manager's office, and uh, and that takes some difficulty because they don't like have one department raid another department, uh, and he worked for the city manager, and in that job he found out that the information they were getting from the city attorney's office wasn't all that good, <laughs> but he helped build up the city, the downtown city of Oakland, when everything was still empty. And then they had this, uh, this big change in, 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 the, uh, in the people who were working in Palo Alto on the, and, and, and they all moved into Oakland and Oakland got built up and he was responsible for the development of, uh, of uh, downtown Oakland. And, and then after the city attorney, after the city manager left, he had a job in private industry in, 
in, in, in developing areas and persuading the communities what the advantage of the developments would be. And in this job, it was not too successful because it turns out that there are politics involved in the areas, in, in, any, in any kind of development, there's always positive and negative aspects. And so the project he was working on was essentially uh, uh, finished. The man who was, in ch who was, who was uh, uh, financing the thing uh, didn't want to continue it. And so he, he uh, left that position, and that was fairly recent. And he was kept on till the end of, of the year. And then got a job in, uh, in New Orleans to help the, the New Orleans uh, government wasn't functioning too well in rebuilding the city. So after they Katrina? hired- After the After the, uh, Katrina? Yes, oh. after Katrina. So they hired a czar, a manager, Ed Blakely, to come in and help organize the people who were employed in the, in the, in the uh, government and get them to work together more successfully. And my son had a relationship with him, and so we hired my son to do the actual work. So he worked at that for uh, almost a year. And then his wife was, he was, is, is a, was German, wanted to go back to Germany uh, permanently. And she did that uh, last year, and, and uh, it didn't work out. So they returned in July, and he is now looking for a position, but he thinks he may have one again in the city in, in, in reorganizing some aspects of what needs to be done in California. He was instrumental in, um, in getting 10 to 15 groups to agree on how to utilize the money that would be collected from raising the tolls on the bridges for their separate projects, which is quite a, a, an achievement to get people to work together in sharing something of that nature. Sure, well, that, that sounds good. Um, let me ask you, um, how about an outstanding event in your life? Do you have one of those? Can you think of something? Well, the outstanding event in my life, I still goes back to this, the uh, March the 1st, 1948, when I sent that sample over to Switzerland for analysis. The, that is the crystals, the crystal uh, structure, the crystal serotonin creatinine sulfate. Because after two years of work, I didn't think it would be possible to do that. And then suddenly it was possible, and that was a defining moment. And, and as I say, it was, I have had a number of minor successes in my life up to that point. Uh, but nothing that was that substantial. And that was the first time I really felt I was capable of doing something important. Good. How about an outs uh, a, um, outstanding event? Which that, how about, do you have a favorite tradition? Favorite? Any particular tradition that you might, some people think of something at school or whatever, do you have a tradition? Uh, Something special that comes to mind? Like no, I, I think I think that the satisfaction I got from from running the chemistry assistance uh, program in high school sounds good. That I I think the satisfaction I get from helping people is right. is, is is I still find very rewarding. That comes to my next question. On your retirement act, do you share with researchers what you're doing in your post retirement? Well, I, I, I have a medical history that says it's not going to, I'm not going to last that long. I had a heart attack on my 59th birthday, and, uh, and I have a number of ailments that are uh, fairly substantial that mean any time anything goes wrong, um, it'll be exaggerated by the other things that are going wrong. So I never made a real commitment to something new because I didn't think I'd be able to complete it. So I now represent what my daughter calls a uh, role model of survival. Sounds <laughs> and, good. 
sounds good. And, and, and I, was, I was asked to come back, I, I, the two places I might have gone, but people who knew me at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, one of the professors at the time, I was a professor there, was now chairman, and he invited me to come back. Oh, that's very nice. And that's, so you continue that, that's what you're doing. And, and, uh, yes. Uh, in some closing remarks and comments, in summary, what would you like to share with the researchers as you look back or look ahead? What I, what I try to tell people now, because the jobs that people get are really quite limited in what they can hope to accomplish. So I tell them we are governed by rewarding systems. There are external rewards and internal rewards. And the external rewards are undependable. So you have to find some way of cultivating some internal reward to compensate for the fact that the external rewards may not be as satisfying as you'd like them to be. And that's not an easy task. Right. I agree. But it's still, if you think of it in those terms, it helps a great deal to find a way to develop the internal rewards. Right. Agree. Very nice. Any other uh, comments <clears throat> before we close off the end of the interview? The other system, uh, the, the generalization I make has to do with kinetics. That, that there are, and as a matter of fact, if they're related to the reward system, that reward systems um, are short order or longer order. Babies, for example, have no time discipline. They need to be, get their reward immediately. And so in terms of the reward systems, the time factor gets to be extremely important. And if you have the strength to deal with reward systems on a longer time period, that's a big advantage. Because I would say that in research, it's pretty frustrating work. Most of the things you try don't work. And so that how do you continue going? And of course, the, the, the success I've had in science has been the result of long-term rewards that have compensated for the long-term frustrations associated with non-rewards. Yeah. And you can deal with personalities the same way. There are people that are more kinetic than others. Some people are slower to deal with, some people faster to deal with, and until you appreciate the kinetic pattern in individuals, you don't understand how to deal with the difficulties that sometimes arise between you. Good. Very good. I want to thank you very much. This has been very helpful, and I know researchers will benefit very much by this. Thank you. This ends the interview.